Once in a while, I get asked if I grew up reading The New Yorker, and um, the answer is that my father was a small town dentist, and so therefore my patrimony is anesthesia and magazines. He had um, an office in the basement. But I, I have to make a confession. When I was a, a young guy, really getting interested in magazines for the first time is something more than something just to leaf through and look at a quick drawing or an article about the local sports team. Um, the magazines that really grabbed me in the 70s were what was called the New Journalism Magazines, Esquire in those, in those days, and uh, Rolling Stone in those days. And it was very foolish of me because what I didn't realize is that everything that Tom Wolfe was calling the New Journalism, um, Joe Mitchell and A.J. Liebling and many people before, Janet Flanner, had uh, more than uh, invented before uh, Tom Wolfe was even in a white suit. Um, and I began to read The New Yorker uh, more and more and more. And the generation of New Yorker writers that really grabbed me first were the generation of, say, John McPhee or uh, Bud Trillin, Calvin Trillin. And in 1989, I'd, I, I was living in Moscow, and I'd, I'd heard of Sandy Fraser. Um, and I'd read a few humor pieces, and I'd read um, what I thought to be his talk pieces, although in those days they weren't signed. But somebody sent me three issues of The New Yorker in 1989, in the beginning of 1989. Um, it was called The Great Plains, Great Plains. And it was a, uh, a series of pieces that became a book about that big swath in the middle uh, of the country, what's horribly known as flyover country. And to me, it was the most original piece of writing I think I had read in years and years. It was, it was absolutely thrilling, and it began like this. Away to the great plains of America, to that immense western short grass prairie now mostly plowed under. Away to the still empty land beyond newsstands and malls and velvet restaurant ropes. Away to the headwaters of the, of the Missouri, now quelled by many impundent uh, dams and to the headwaters of the Platte, and to the almost invisible headwaters of the slurped-up Arkansas, away to the land where TV used to set its most popular dramas, but not anymore. And this was a voice I had never encountered before, something that was steeped in uh, the American Renaissance of Twain and Whitman, and at the same time, maybe the Harvard Lampoon and Saturday Night Live and 20th century irony. I loved it. And it was a writer that just hooked into me and has stayed there ever since. You know his books. Uh, he has a wonderful book called On the Res, a book called Family, uh, collections of his nonfiction, uh, as well as his humor collections like uh, Coyote vs. Acme, um, <laughs> which is quite amazing. Uh, and now he's written a book that I have to say, and in some way it bookends um, Great Plains, what I really think is a masterpiece of American uh, nonfiction, and it's called Travels in Siberia. And so today we're going to have a conversation about humor, about his new book, and about whatever comes up. Please welcome Sandy Fraser. Thank you, David. I think Sandy's going to start out by reading a little something. Um, I'm going to read a humor piece or part of a humor piece, and it has a kind of a bearing on what we'll be talking about later. Um, I have read this piece before, and if you've heard it, I hope you will enjoy hearing it again. Uh, the piece is called Bad Advice. Some years ago, on a camping trip in the pine woods of northern Michigan, my friend Don brought along a copy of an outdoor cookbook that appeared on the bestseller list at the time. This book contained many ingenious and easy-sounding recipes. One that Don especially wanted to try was called Breakfast in a Paper Bag. <laughs> According to this recipe, you could take a small paper lunch sack, put strips of bacon in the bottom, break an egg into the sack on top of the bacon, fold down the top of the sack, push a stick through the fold, hold the sack over hot coals, and cook the bacon and egg in the sack in about 10 minutes. 
I watched as Don followed the directions exactly. Both he and I remarked that we would naturally have thought the sack would burn. The recipe, however, declared grease will coat the bottom of the bag as it cooks. Somehow, we both took this to mean that the grease counterintuitively actually made the bag less likely to burn. <laughs> Marveling at the who would have guessed magic of it, <laughs> we picked a good spot in the hot coals of our campfire, and Don held the sack above them. We watched. In a second and a half, the bag burst into leaping flames. Don was yelling for help, waving the bag around trying to extinguish it, scattering egg yolk and smoldering strips of bacon and flaming paper into the combustible pines, <laughs> while people at adjoining campfires stared in horror and wondered what they should do. The wild figures that the burning breakfast described in midair as Don waved the stick, <laughs> the look of outraged, imbecile shock reflected on our faces. Those are images that stay with me. <laughs> I replay the incident often in my mind. It is like a parable. Because a book told us to, <laughs> We attempted to use greased paper as a frying pan on an open fire. For all I know, the trick is possible if you do it just so. We never repeated the experiment. But to me, the incident illustrates a larger truth about our species when it ventures out of doors. We go forth in abundant ignorance, near blind with fantasy, witlessly trusting words on a page or a tip a guy we'd never met before gave us at a sporting goods counter in a giant discount store. <laughs> About half the time, the faith that leads us into the outdoors is based on advice that is half-baked, made up, hypothetical, uninformed, spurious, or deliberately, heedlessly bad. <laughs> Sandy, you started out at the New Yorker and at, at, in college even writing humor pieces. And I know there's no great evidence at college that you actually went, strictly speaking, to college. But sure. But there's a lot of evidence that you spent a lot of time at the Lampoon, and then you got to the New Yorker and began writing humor pieces and, and talk of the town pieces, and then you became this extremely ambitious um, nonfiction writer. How are these two activities linked up? Well, um, I started out writing humor because that was actually what I was hired to do. That's what Mr. Sean uh, wanted, more humor at the time. And I got there, and I didn't write it. I wrote one piece, and then like 18 months went by. And uh, Mr. Sean's secretary said, Mr. Sean would like to talk to you. And uh, she said, he'll call you. So I sat in my office, and I sat in my office looking at the phone for, you know, nine hours. <laughs> and at 7.30 in the evening, the phone rang, and it was Mr. Sean. And he said, hello, Mr. Frazier. I said, hello. And he said, I just wanted to tell you more humor. <laughs> so I wrote another piece. <laughs> and then I went another two years or something. What were, doing, what were you doing in your office in the meantime? And so I was writing talk stories. Oh, okay. I mean, I wasn't, there was nothing else to do. I would, just didn't get that many ideas. But it, it's not like you were smoking crack in your office. No. I wasn't one of the people that did that, I no. Know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, after a while, and, and older people on The New Yorker would say, you know, you're never going to support yourself this way. You've got to do something else. And so I started writing reporting pieces. And... I found I really enjoyed it, and I also always tried to find an idea that w had some humor to it. And when I first came up with the idea of doing Great Plains, I was living in Montana, and I called Mr. Sean, and I said, I want to do a six-part profile of the Great Plains, as if the Great Plains were a person. I want to write this, you know, with a big big canvas piece about the Great Plains. There was a long pause, and Mr. Sean said, would it be funny? 
And I said, well, you know, 50 million buffalo wiped out. I mean, I don't know. There's some, <laughs> something there. But so I, I always pick a, a subject where there is something funny. And uh, Russia, you may agree, is the funniest country. It's nothing but yucks. It's a hilarious country. And, and it's, it has, some countries are funny unintentionally, like France or Sweden. Russia is funny both intentionally and unintentionally. How, how do you mean? Well, I mean, some of the things it does are just, I've tried to describe this. It's like, the reason I read that piece is because it's, I don't write slapstick very much, but um, it's slapstick. And Russia is like slapstick, only you actually die. Uh, so Russia is like extreme humor. Uh, and I'd been writing humor for years, and that appealed to me, the thought of, you know, I mean, everything, I think Russia's produced some of the funniest writers, uh, so that falls into the intentional category. And then it just does, you know, ridiculous things. I mean, just reading the Russian newspaper, and there's Putin shirtless, acting out a Russian fairy tale. Um, he doesn't know that's funny, probably, although he might. But uh, Sidney, you started as a reporter, and you, you hadn't been a reporter. And all of a sudden, you're asking questions of people and writing down what they say. Mm -hmm. Was it hard for you to learn how to do I that? never did learn how to do that. I, I still am. I, and I'm glad I, you tell me now. Yeah, I know. I mean, you actually can do that, and I'm, I'm in awe of that. I. Uh, but it's not a natural human activity to ask no. people rude, probing questions and expect them to answer and write it down and then publish it and, and so on. It, it, yeah, I'm the opposite of a persistent journalist. That when, if somebody says, well, I can't talk to you, I go, okay, okay. I mean, I back off. <laughs> so I, I um, you know, I just started doing it in talk stories. I started, you know, slow. Um, usually I talk to people who haven't been interviewed before. And for that, it's, you know, a lot of people, nobody ever listens to them. And that kind of subject, I think people are grateful to have somebody listen to them. I think if you just went around America in a pickup truck that said on the side, I will listen to you, <laughs> that people would flock around you and you'd have a line, you know, and, and what they'd say would probably be, you know, I took the dog to the vet, and it was, you know, it's just some ordinary thing, but that people aren't listened to usually. They aren't listened to by their families or their coworkers. And if you stop and say, how do you do that? How do you? They're grateful. And so I don't, it's true, I don't take that many notes at the time, and I don't tape record. So my usual, and I find that the people I interview very often are, uh, once they think they're being interviewed, they get kind of, oh, this is official. And they'll start to use words you realize that's not how they really talk. If they start saying proceeded, you know, I proceeded down to the dock and I proceeded to get in my boat. And you realize, okay, we got to make this a little more relaxed somehow. <laughs> so I often will just print out everything I remember. I mean, mentally print it out huh. later. And Sandy, were the first Russians that you met and spent time with, Komar and Melamed, these sort of conceptual right. artists in New York, is that how you kind of got the Russia bug? Yeah. I mean, they told me Maybe about... Maybe explain who they are for okay. those who don't know. These are Russian artists uh, who used to work together. They no longer work together. Um, and they came in, like, 78. And I saw in the, the uh, uh, press release printout that we used to get in the talk department that these Russian artists were going to be giving a talk up at uh, Sarah Lawrence. And I went up there and I watched their talk and it was just the craziest thing I ever saw. They had, they said, well, we'll paint pictures of your ancestors. And they had a thing and it was a picture, it was dinosaurs, right? Uh, they said, we just bought Andy Warhol's soul. Oh, it was great. And then there's a picture of Andy Warhol, like accepting a dollar and signing something, his soul, which he sold to Komar and Melvin. Uh, and they were just crazy, and I wrote something about them, and it was like the second thing, I think, that was written about them, and so, in America. And eventually, I wrote a profile of them, we got to be friends, and just everything they 
told me about growing up. I just couldn't get enough of it. And, and these are artists that had been kind of more or less flushed out. Right. They the, were dissidents. The Russian scene. Right. And part of that show at... Um, they were part of the famous Bulldozer show right. in Moscow right. in like 73. That, a show that they did on their own with a bunch of other Russian artists that was attacked with bulldozers. <laughs> and just that for funny Russian stuff. The Russians brought uh, street sprinklers like the stuff you sprinkle to keep the dust down on the street, they're going to sprinkle the paintings. And you see these things, they're photos of them like impending on this little art show out in a field and it was just hilarious. Yeah, I, I still have a lump on the back of my head. So funny. I got knocked <laughs> that bad. At a demo. No, 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 I'm not that oh, old. Okay. But, um, but demonstrations that came later. Next. So the Great Plains you could negotiate in English. You grew up in American. Right. You know the... You can study up. You know where, you know where the the kind of uh, lines are going to lead you, or at least you you have a start mm -hmm. culturally, linguistically, all the rest. Mm -hmm. Siberia is real. I mean, where did you get this insane idea? That, first of all, there's a big literature on it. Right. Um, it's it's the mother of all ambitious ideas to do a kind of comic, and yet serious historical peopled. Um, Tra a travel log doesn't do it justice what it is. I mean, to put your arms around this, it's a kind of insane idea. It's a very Russian idea. Well, it was, it's something it, that Mel Brooks once said that he picked titles that, he could, that, was, that were fun to say he was working on. So he would say, people would say, what are you working on? He'd say, oh, a musical called Springtime for Hitler. You know, <laughs> and that was centuries before he actually did the, the thing as a, as a movie. Uh, um, but I would say I'm working on a book about Siberia. And it was always, it was just sort of something to say, but it was also, it was true. I wanted to pick a huge, huge subject. Uh, a lot of nonfiction now will take a tiny thing and then expand it out. Salt. Salt or cod or la latitude and longitude or something like that, yeah. which is a valid way to proceed. But I wanted to just start with the big thing and see what happened. Uh, and how did you initially see yourself doing this? I mean, you, you learned Russian. Right. It's not easy. Thanks, I mean, thanks and, to the and New Yorkers to you. Well, and, and, and did a hell of, of just stacks and stacks of books. And um, did, did you ever get discouraged by the, the scale of it? Yeah. I went? mean, and, and I think at the very beginning when I would go over there, I was such a uh, naive. I just, I, I was like referred to as the stupid American. So they would say, you know, you have this stupid American friend, they would later say. Or I over, I happened to see an email that one of my Russian friends had sent to another one. And they said, uh, you know, take care of Nasha Bezumni Sandy. <laughs> our crazy Sandy. Our crazy Sandy. Like I was, uh, but it worked for me, I think, too, because um, when you're young and you're doing reporting, most of the people you talk to are older than you, and they feel a little bit superior, and they're happy to give you advice. And that's not a bad, it's not bad to have your subject feel a little bit superior to you, because then they relax and they tell you things they might not have said. But once you get older, it's hard to kind of have that relationship unless you go to another country. And then you're speaking like moron <laughs> questions, you know, me think funny here what you do. And, and, uh, and they will kind of, okay, this guy's an idiot. And then they'll sort of bring you along. And so a lot of it was my being educated by Russians. Like, okay, this guy's, okay, let's just tell him what's going on because he has no idea. And that, and that worked almost as a reporting. Tell thing. everybody what it's like. You, you, people here who have been to Russia, the, the, the few of you, or I don't know how many of you have been, you've probably been to Moscow and St. Petersburg and maybe a third place. What is Siberia like? How did you do it? Um, how did you conceive of, of structuring the book as a result? Um, I took a trip, and when I, I I'm going to show slides in a little bit, but I, I took the first trip I took, um, I was so stunned and dazzled by it. I was just in love with Russia, and it's a weird, and I still have this feeling, and I believe you are afflicted with it too. Uh, I call it the dread Russia love <laughs> because you love it. And I went, somebody, when I was first there, somebody said, uh, 
you know, what do you think of Moscow? I had a group of people in the Moscow apartment. And I said, this is the greatest place I ever was in my life. And they looked at me like, what? And sometime later, I was... So, but what is it? What, what is what love is it? based on? What, what, I, I think it's be partly because of our childhood. Because Russia was important when we were kids. I mean, it was something all the grown-ups like talked about. War, it was like the, the other, other side yeah. of us. And yet it's quite familiar. The things they did are so familiar. Uh, when you see, like, a statue there uh, to some Cold War figure, and you go and you can really, you know, okay, I know what I was doing on the day this happened. You know, it, you have this correspondence in your own life. And then I think everybody also just is... Um, they have another country. I think every person mm. has another country. Mm. And whatever you're, you have another country that you love. I did a profile of Heloise many years ago. She was a household hints person. She lived in San Antonio, Texas. She loved China from her youth. She had every China thing you could imagine. This is a little girl in Texas. Why? I don't know. I just, you know, I listened to Peter and the Wolf when I was four. I remember just you know, as a very young kid being fascinated with it. So is it, is it the, it's, it's the verbalness. Uh, it's the talk, isn't it? I mean, one of, the, one of the great, wonderful things about Russians, for the most part, is their unbelievable capacity, uh, often lubricated by vodka, but not always, to talk and be funny and ironic. And that seems very familiar and yet different and off. That, that always appealed to me. I mean, the endless hours at a kitchen table mm -hmm. and the soci sociability Mm -hmm. That we don't, in our modern world of, I'll, we can make an appointment for lunch three, three weeks down the line, that, especially in kind of pre-wealth Russia, is, is the norm. I really, I found that appealing. The ability of Russians to sit at a dinner table and drink tea and, and talk is just unbelievable. I've never, you know, you're on your eighth cup of tea, you know. And I think in, in the book I say that I think tea probably has done more damage to Russia than vodka. <laughs> because this is where they say, you know, there's a new theory by Marx, and this sounds interesting. And I think it's the opportunity for infection with, from ideas. So uh, but how, did, how did you go? You, 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 you met people that you thought could be your kind of Virgil to take you across mm -hmm. the River Styx. Who were they? How did you set this up? Uh, I went to St. Petersburg. I walked all over St. Petersburg. I was living there uh, in the apartment of a friend. I found a museum, the Museum of the Arctic and the Antarctic, that I really liked. I kept going back to this museum. I met people who worked at the museum. I asked if they knew anybody who could take me across Russia, and they did. It was sort of to make a, a simple story out of it. And those two guys were guys I had never, you know, I had never heard of them. I didn't know anything about them. I met them, you know, on the street. They came to meet me. We talked. I thought they seemed reliable. And uh, so the next Let's thing... drive across Siberia? Right, so the next thing, I'm wiring them $5,000. And it was... <laughs> fortunately, it was not my money at the time. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, and they did actually turn out to be reliable. They were, but, but I would just met them on the street. It wasn't. And you like, would go from place to place, mm -hmm. sleeping in tents. Right. And this is, by the way, I should say, this is something I don't share with Sandy. Sandy, I, the, New, the New Yorker, I hope, is very strong on environmental issues, and I want the outdoors to be there and, and healthy. I just don't personally want it. <laughs> and this may be the only thing I share with William Sean in, in sensibility, it, is that when Sandy first proposed writing a, a fishing story. What, what, don't you, what, what did William Sean say about uh, I wanted to write about fishing for Sean, and he kept saying no. And finally, I just really said, you know, I love to fish, and I have these stories, and it would be great. And he said, well, uh, all right. He said, but he said, fishing in itself is fine, but then you have the fish. <laughs> and the fish is hooked. And then he went, <laughs> beyond this point, we cannot move. This is it. And so he said, could you write a fishing story and not mention hooks? And I did. I wrote 14,250 words of a guy who had a fishing tackle shop. And I did Grand, not Grand hooks. Central, right? Right, the guy by uh, Angler's Roost. And you know, by the way, what comes with fishing? Sleeping on the ground. I, uh, and you slept on the ground right. from one end of Siberia to another. 
Um, how did people greet you in, in, in towns? To tell us. As we that. got farther out into uh, Siberia, we were curiosities just by our license plate. Also, the guys that I was with uh, reconfigured. They they changed our van so that it, it appeared to be an emergency rescue vehicle. <laughs> so it would be like finding an EMS truck, you know, out in the middle of, of Nebraska by a lake, you know. Uh, and so they would come by and ask about us, and they were very sweet, like country people are yeah, And your, nice. your pals seemed to have a great old time. And they had a great time. And you were like a nun. I was, well, see, the, yeah. The uh, uh, the guys were kind of on a you know it was like spring break. <laughs> spring break Siberia. Spring break Siberia. Spring break break Baikal for uh, Sergey and Volodya, and uh, so we would just be camped places, and women would just show up, and I would you know get into my tent and everything. I was I, was, I didn't drink also, which was just I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I wore my seatbelt which insults people in Russia to get in there Terrible. and put on your seatbelt. You first get there and you go to put your seatbelt on, and, 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 and it's not necessary. And it's an insult to the usually masculinity. Right. You don't think I can drive? Yeah. And I, I don't think you can drive. Right. But, <laughs> but I, I think, think you're drunk. Yeah, I think <laughs> we'll be impaired driving. And of course, in Russia, they also put little monuments of where people have had wrecks. And sometimes they have the cars there. <laughs> and the cars are just these. They say, I'm, I'm putting on my seatbelt. And I spent more time, like, hunting down, you know, behind the seat to find the thing that had never been used since the car was in Japan, you know. So, anyway, we would be in these places, and, and, uh, and women would show up. And then Sergei and Volodya would, uh, would Off be go. gone. And I would be in the camp by myself. <laughs> and they'd kind of say, you know, keep an eye on the van. Uh, <laughs> And that would be my job, and then they would come back, and they would have had just a marvelous time. And, and sometimes the women would come back with them, and I tried to show that I was taking a very dim view of this. And they did not care. Right. I told them, I said, guys, I'm writing a book, and this is going to be in the book. And it is in the book. So, you know, Sergei and is married. Volodya ended up getting divorced. Uh, but it's it, it was an unavoidable an unavoidable thing. I say you started working on. I don't mean to pick at a tender scab, but you, you started working at this book in 1993. It's mm -hmm. 2010. Mm -hmm. The internet's been invented, and <laughs> right. Uh, Derek Jeter is now an old player. Um, what took you so long? Um, well, I had other things I had to do, and learning the language took a long time. I, re I, didn't, I didn't learn it very well, but I learned it well enough to get around. I read books in Russian, which took me a long time. Um, but it was a recurring question. People would say, whatever happened to your Siberia book? And I was on the subway one time, and this was about four years ago, five years ago, and Chip McGrath, who was at the time the editor of the New York Times Book Review, happened to be in the same subway car. And he came up to me and said, hi. And I said, hi, Chip. And he said, whatever happened to your Siberia book? And I said, you mean to tell me you didn't see it? <laughs> it came out 18 months ago. It was 800 pages long, Travels in Siberia. You didn't see it. And he said, oh, my God, no, I missed it. <laughs> and he was mortified, you know. He, he said, I see a lot of books. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know you had one out. I'm really sorry. And uh, just as I got off, I said, Chip, I was kidding. I haven't written it. And... <laughs> For the next four years, when people asked me or when the subject, I would tell that story. And then I realized after a while that I was either going to have that story or I would have the book. Uh, so I kind of stopped telling that story and started writing the book. But it was, yeah, it was, it was a long time. My, my son, who was three months, four months old when I started it, now does the computer stuff for the, you know, that I need done. And, and my daughter was little, and she's now a senior in college. So, And, and Sandy, you, you mentioned reading for this. Who, who really influenced you in terms of what you learned about Siberia and also about how to approach this book? Um, 
You mentioned George Kennan a lot. And well, George Parker. Kennan was the person who was sort of the lodestar because he was somebody from the same town that my family's from in Ohio, and he was this very famous... Not George Kennan, the diplomat. There are two George Kennan. Hey. This is the original George Kennan, as I call him. <laughs> it was that more recent George Kennan's like second cousin or first cousin twice removed, I believe. Anyway, the first George Kennan was born in 1845, and he, as a young man, uh, attempted to survey a telegraph route across Siberia. And that didn't work out, but he then went back in the 1870s and did a book about um, the prisons in Siberia. And he published the book in 1890, and it was an extremely influential book. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good book, or a fairly good book, by Chekhov called The Island, which is about Sakhalin Island. And in the introduction to the book, Chekhov says, I won't hope to do as good a job as George Kennan did. Well, here's a guy from Norwalk, Ohio, who Chekhov is saying, I don't think I can write as well as he can. So as a kid, even, I was very, I knew about George Kennan. And I just followed, in many places, I followed where he had gone. I wanted to ask you, you, you how many trips did you take? I took five trips over 17 years. And how did you map them out and with what purpose in mind? The fir with each one, I had a different purpose. The first one, I just went to see it. Uh, when I, we lived in Montana, I made a trip from Montana to Alaska and then across from Alaska to Chukotka, which was a, in some ways the most fun because you didn't have the feeling of being so strange. There was all kinds of American stuff there. So everybody has American outboards and American guns and all the native people in Chukotka. Because there's a lot of Alaska. Because it's just trade. going back and forth all the time. And, um, and it feels like Alaska, and it's, uh, it was great. And, and uh, that was also a place where George Kennan had been. And then I figured to really do it, and the more I read about it, I realized that everybody that's done this subject really has crossed it on the ground. Right. And not, there are 50 books about taking the Siberian Railway, but to cross it on the ground. Which is, but the dirty secret is it's very boring. Incredibly yeah. boring, and you it's don't see railways. that much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you just look out the window, you see the same thing, you know, it's not. Great days. And to get off and see things to get back on, you've. Yeah, I did that. I, I did you it, go all the way from Petersburg to Vladivostok? Really it was, it was like really, 11 No, years. not to go to, you go to Beijing. But it was, really, it was yeah. really nothing. I mean, for a little spell it might be fun, but you want to get out and walk around and you want to meet people. And So uh, then I planned to drive. And that was about when you and I started talking about right. it. And so I set that up with these guys that I had met through the Museum of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Then we drove, and the trip, the total time of that trip was like about six and a half weeks. Jesus, so. God. Now, see, I read, a, I, I read a lot of books like this, travel books and books involving journeys that are the most horrible journey in the world, Antarctica books where the ship always ends up being crushed. And we read these with glee. Right. Almost. Um, in other words, the, the writer has suffered so that we may enjoy ourselves mm -hmm. by the fire. Um, you uh, ran into any number of agonies. To me, the agony that I can't even, I can't even bear to think about it so bad is the mosquito agony. I had always heard about um, Siberian mosquitoes, but I, as I say, stayed in the train car. And, and, mm -hmm. and I've been to some places, but it was all flying in and getting out and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, what, what were the real rigors and difficulties of travel in Siberia that you didn't anticipate? And maybe mosquitoes was one of them. Well, there were... Uh or cold or a bunch of different things. One thing was just uncertainty about the food because I, I did get food poisoning in Russia and ha had to go to the hospital. How many times? Uh, I got serious food poisoning only once. That's a good trip. You know, did you get a lot yeah. of food poisoning? And I did not want to get it again. <laughs> it was really, really horrible. So that was, you know, you would eat something and there was always this feeling, you know, we'll wait and find out the returns on this in four hours, you know. But, uh, um, uh, the mosquitoes, you know, there was, uh, believe it or not, quite a bit of boredom. Uh, the Marquis de Custine said, boredom is the divinity of Russia. <laughs> so there's a lot of just sitting there looking out the window. But the, the bugs, all different kinds of bugs, I didn't have, Kennan 
got bitten so badly by bed bugs that he couldn't go on the street. Don't say bed bugs here. I know. This is a horrible <laughs> Not in New York. You'd be all right. But um, uh, when we would stop for dinner, if it was a place with a lot of mosquitoes, it was just, you know, you had to immediately totally put on gloves and tuck your pants into your boots. And, and we had these hats called Nakamarniks, which are like, uh, they're like beekeeper hats. And uh, you're very much restricted. Plus, it's hot. So you're going around in this stuff. And if you don't do it, the mosquitoes were, they were like a ray directed at you. They were just like, I said it was like they were shot at you from a fire hose. And, and uh, you know, they would get all, you would see them like when Volodya was cooking, they would be all around him. And then you'd see like quantum layers of them around him. And the sky would actually be gray with these things. And uh, the food had a lot of mosquitoes in it. So after a while, you just start, you just eat it anyway. Dead ones. Just dead mosquitoes would fall in the food because they'd get over the thing. They'd be attracted by the fumes. And, uh, and the ordinary mosquitoes weren't bad. But occasionally, when you'd be eating, there would be a mosquito, and you'd kind of touch it with your spoon, and it, it would have blood in it. So it already had bitten somebody. And, Protein, though. Yeah. Protein. Very, very good way of... Now, Cindy, you see a lot of things, you go to a lot of places, you go five times. Finally, the one thing I'm not sure non-writers completely get, what is so hard, is, is to make a story, to make structure out of unstructured experience. You know, we have a mutual friend, John McPhee, who makes a fetish of this. He cuts up his notebooks and he right. uses darts to tr try to plot new structures about one river trip that goes in one direction and he makes it into a circle and he switches tenses and he does all kinds of things. It's a lot of thought. Now, you've, this is a lot of experience over a lot of years. Then you have to make a book out of it. You have to make sense out of it. How did you plot out this book? How did you structure it? How did you figure it out? I did it basically in terms of the five trips. So the book is in five parts and each part has a trip in it. Um, that was sort of the, the big structure. I read a lot of stuff about this, about the subject. And the reason this is called Travels in Siberia is not only because I took many trips, but because I read about all kinds of different people that traveled there. And what's really exciting or just thrilling to me about a travel book is you can go to the same place that somebody was 100 years ago, 400 years ago, and it's like you're on a you're in an arena where great people have played before. It's, there's something uh, timeless about it. So in each section, I took books that really moved me or that just I thought were exciting or funny or had something to do with that particular place where I was. Mm -hmm. And I included, you know, what I read and what had happened to these other travelers in these places. And a recurring theme was the Decembrists, who had this uh, aborted revolution uh, in 1825, and many, like over 100 of them, were sent to Siberia. And I knew what their biographies had been after they got there, so that it was also um, kind of talking about this Russian dream of, you know, uh, a real dream of democracy or of some kind of better form of government that had existed there for all these, you know, uh, uh, all these years but had never really come to fruition. And when I was there, when we were there, you know, they, you were seeing them hoping mm. for something to work out. And so there was this... Even that far outside of oh, the city. Oh, yeah. And people were so, they're so friendly toward Americans and so... And they would just ask you about stuff about America, or they would just come up to you. And, you know, a guy came up to me in, like, the worst place I ever was. This crew cut guy who's wearing a shirt with a Kalashnikov rifle on it. Where is the worst place you were? Uh, well, this is a town called Chernyshevsk. Mm -hmm. It's named after Chernyshevsky, the guy who wrote the most Stow Delet, the worst book, book ever, ever written. The Stow worst Delet. book. What is, what is to be done, which became Lenin's... Um, Lenin's theme. favorite book. Yeah. And I read it. It exists. You can still get a modern edition of it. And to say that it's boring, it's 
it's just an incredibly bad book. And everything in it really is bad. The dialogue is so terrible. Yeah. And you just think Lenin is sitting there going, ooh, that was a good one. And, <laughs> and all of like socialist realist art, which was, I think, in balance a disaster, is sort of based on Chernyshevsky. And this town was based, named after Chernyshevsky, and it had a statue of Chernyshevsky. And it's like this huge statue of him standing there like, you know. And there's no kind of little asterisk saying, wrote the worst book in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the worst town. It's parodied in that early Nabokov novel, The Gift. It, it's it, there, are a bunch of, yeah. there are a bunch of different people that uh, parody. Uh, Sandy, uh, you, you use a comic voice a lot in this book, and yet one of the great horrors of the 20th century takes place on this landscape. And the, the one thing that most Westerners know about Siberia is that the gulag system was based largely in Siberia, although the gulag system was essentially the Soviet Union itself. Um, and you went to some camps. And what did you find? Well, that's, um, it took a long time to find them because the guys I was with did not want to go there. Why is that? I don't know. People said maybe they were... I don't know, KGB, or they were trying not to show this to me. Or maybe it was just simple national pride. I mean, I know that when I'm out in the American West and I see, you know, I've been a wounded knee, which is a horribly sad place. And when you see, like, French and German tourists there kind of looking at you, ooh, what you Same guys did, it, yeah. you know, and I like, what well, we did, you know. And it is kind of an awkward, you know, thing. And I think that they... Uh, Sergei and Volodya were not, they felt like, well, you know, they felt a certain wounded pride, possibly. So it did take me a long time to find th the places. Um, there, when you're at a place like that, it's, it's so sad as to be kind of stunning. Uh, and, and there's also so much shame. I, I hadn't realized it's just... It, it, like when people, you know, when you see something awful, you're you're ashamed. But it's not like Auschwitz or or or, or Bel Belsen or it, it, there are there's no, not a lot of there there when you go to a a former gulag. I do outpost. not know. There is a gulag, I think, in west of the Urals that has been, you know, kind of primped up primped to make, up to make it as the Auschwitz. But most of them, if most of them are just sitting out there yeah. and nothing is there. There's no marker. There's no nothing. And the one that I the went to... A little barbed wire and a guard tower. Yeah, there's... Bar I will show, because I have a picture of it, but there's, there's no... Uh, nothing has been done. And because it's in the permafrost zone, um, it, it hasn't decayed, you know? Sandy, a few weeks ago, on the cover of Time magazine, there was a picture of John Franzen. It said, the great American novelist. And I wonder if you think that nonfiction writing has gotten the a creative nonfiction writing, um, literary nonfiction writing, has ever gotten the kind of um, props mm -hmm. that the novel has? And if not, why not? Well, uh, nonfiction is perishable in a way that, I mean, all writing is perishable, but nonfiction is connected to something in the real world, and the real world is going to change. The, the basis of a thing of nonfiction is, you know, George Kennan. He's seeing the prison system in 1874. But nobody cares about the prison system of 1874 now because the prison system has changed. So that nobody bothers, why would you read that book? Because the circumstances are not the same. And that builds a certain unavoidable decay into a work of nonfiction. And to me, that only makes it cooler because it's like humor. You had to be there. It's a performance art. You're going to, like, there are great Balanchine dances. Who knows exactly what they were? They existed when they existed, and they're gone. And that appeals very strongly to me, the fact that, you know, we're right here now. We're doing this. This is exciting. You mean to Our say there's, there's no lasting nonfiction in there? There is. And it, but that is like a dinosaur footprint. You know, there are lots of dinosaur footprints, but just a couple of them make it down to the... To the is, that we, is that the big game that you're shooting for? I think something like that. I would love to have a piece, a work of nonfiction that people would read as they read Walden. You know, Walden is a work of nonfiction, but it managed to jump over whatever hurdle there are, the hurdles that there are. Uh, Boswell's Life of Johnson. 
fascinating piece of nonfiction, right. and it's still alive. Why? I don't know. It just lucked out. There are complicated factors. You can uh, Caesar's Gallic Wars, a great, great original basic piece of nonfiction, with the original nonfiction sentence, which is the beginning of the book, which is all Gaul is divided into three parts. And this is it. This is like the most beautiful sentence. And we still know it. Why? Because of Caesar, because he was great, you know. Uh, they're just... And Latin lessons. And Latin lessons, because you had to learn Latin. But Sandy, when, uh, one fight, uh, soon we're going to... Um, this is usually a room clearer in normal society, but I think we're going to show slides. It's actually going to be... Uh, uh, okay. Um, but uh, some nonfiction writers, like Gates Lee, for example, when he started writing those profiles in Esquire about Joe Lewis and um, Floyd Patterson and Josh Logan and so on, he, the model there was of a very simple short story style, like an Irwin Shaw short story, and, and he trans transferred that to nonfiction. Probably wasn't the first, and he wasn't the last. Your models, when you're trying to figure out how to do a book like this, whether consciously or not, are all nonfiction. Partly fiction, in other words, who's who's your kind of lodestar, um, if 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 there is one or two. In travel, um, Huckleberry Finn, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, all kinds of things happen in that book that veer off the river, that aren't the river, that, you know, and and uh, and it has a voice, of course, and it is funny, um, and um, it doesn't really have. It's sort of existential and like. Where, where are they actually going? What's right. really going to happen? The end is famous for being bad, you know? So that it is just that journey. I, I, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, all American travel probably comes from that, comes from that somehow or another. Sandy's going to show some slides and narrate them. I think I should probably get out of the way of the screen a little bit. I don't bit. know that you'll cast a shadow. I, we're okay? Yeah. I think I will cast a shadow. The table? I don't know what the hell to do. No, I think it works without that. Um, you don't want to see me move the table. That could get ugly. I'll, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Is that all right? Everybody Can everybody see? see this? Okay. Okay. Didn't think of this. May before. I make a suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Okay. <laughs> this, uh, I made this map. Uh, and uh, I cut those letters out of construction paper. Um, and I just wanted to show so that you see what this, the, we haven't really talked about the geography of it, but this is, what you're looking at is eight time zones. So the United States is four time zones. Um, and uh, you see the big, and it is sort of divided by watersheds, and the watersheds are really interesting because they kind of interlock. Uh, but these four rivers, which you can't quite, it's a little blurry, but the Ob, the Yenisei, the Lena, and then this river down here, the Amur, which comes out to uh, the Sea of Okhotsk. And these are the big uh, watersheds of Siberia. The Ural Mountains are the eastern, uh, the western boundary, and the sea, uh, these various seas of the Pacific uh, are the eastern boundary, and then the Arctic Ocean is the northern boundary, and this southern boundary is in the steppe country, uh, with Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and China are the countries uh, that uh, border it. And this, to me, was totally fascinating, the steppe country, because the Mongols came out of the steppes, and the Mongols were just, for humor, you can't beat them. <laughs> <laughs> this is just... The Who was thing. the Shecky Green of the Mongols? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had a couple like famous guys. Um, and this is a Siberian landscape I just put in because it is, I think, kind of beautiful. Um, it looks like maybe almost something that you would see manifest destiny, you know, like the American West. But in fact, I mean, and it, it does resemble it. It doesn't show how swampy this is. So down there, you're just gonna mosquitoes are just gonna come at you. So I have a part about people that were sent to Siberia. Lenin was sent to Siberia. This is what he looked like when he was sent. He was a young guy. He was sent for leafleting, I think, in Moscow. And while he was in Siberia, uh, he read. 
He hunted, he fished, he skated on the frozen Yenisei River. He got married, uh, and he generally seemed to have had a really good time. Uh, and he got an allowance from the government of 12 rubles a month, which was had, he had money left over to buy books. So uh, um, this was not so harsh, uh, an exile. This is the second time he went to Siberia. By this point, he's been through a lot. Uh, he has died, and uh, this is his, uh, what the Russians call the mummy, this is him, and it was sent to Siberia when the Germans were invading so that they wouldn't capture him. And uh, he then came back afterwards, and he was not in real good shape, but they fixed him up again. This is Maria Volkonskaya, and she is the wife of a famous Decembrist, and she herself was very famous. Pushkin said that uh, her hair was more lustrous than daylight and darker than night. And I asked Sergei, was Marie Volkonskaya a lover of Pushkin? Uh, was she uh, Pushkin's lover? And uh, Sergei said all women were Pushkin's lover. Uh, this is another woman who was sent to Siberia. This is Anna Korba. And she was sent for, she was a member of People's Will, which was a radical, actually terrorist organization. This woman went to Siberia with her husband. Her husband was sent, and she accompanied him. And I just put her in because she looks so contemporary and, and, and I think, really pretty. Uh, this is Katerina Breshkovskaya, who was called the little grandmother of the Russian Revolution. And she, you know, smuggled explosives. She did all kinds of stuff. And she lived into the 20th century, well into the 20th century. Um, and she was sent to this exile village called Barguzin. This is Georgette Mosbacher. <laughs> and uh, she was threatened with social Siberia if she had a party in her building for someone who the other people in the building did not like. <laughs> I wanted to illustrate different concepts of Siberia. <laughs> this is George Kennan at his study, in his study, writing. Travels in Siberia, or writing, sorry, <laughs> Siberia in the Exile System. And this was the book that uh, Chekhov read. Tolstoy read this book and was very impressed by it. And George Kennan one day just went to visit Tolstoy. And Tolstoy talked to him all day. I mean, they had a great time. Tolstoy took a little break so he could work on his cobbling. But other than that, they <laughs> talked all day. And Kennan said, you know, I met all these people in Siberia. Can you help them? They have asked for help from the great Tolstoy. And Tolstoy said, these people use violence, and I will not help them. This is my first trip a long time ago uh, in 93. These are people I fished with that guy on the left there in this river, which is the Bargazine River. And this is Bargazine. So when she was sent there, Katerina, Katerina Bryshkovskaya, this place actually was uh, a kind of a, a fancy place because it was a, a, a point for uh, merchants who were bringing uh, fur and uh, stuff from China. So it was a, actually, you think of these towns as being, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, but this was actually a fairly fancy town. This is my second trip. This is my trip to... Providenia, which is in Chukotka. This is like a 45-minute plane ride from Nome, Alaska. And there's Lenin, and he's heading eastward, which is not a good sign. Uh, <laughs> but this is this town, and I, I really enjoyed being over there. It's like a total ghost town now. It was a population of 7,500 in Soviet times, and it's now like 2,000. This is just going around on the Bering Strait on some of the little fjord-like things. And these are puffins, these unbelievable, just hordes of things, hordes of birds. This is a Bering Sea landscape, very cold and uh, hypothermic water, not something you can fall into and live. We went to a place where Eskimos years ago had uh, set up this whole whaling village. And these are whalebone jaws. And there's some, I don't know what whale jawbones, I don't know what the significance of it is. 
but it's, I thought it was in some ways as, as striking as St. Basil's in Moscow. From uh, Siberia in the exile system, and this is a drawing of exiles uh, chained and marching to Siberia. This is uh, a story that Kennan tells in the book about them. See, they're kissing the ground. This is the boundary between Asia and Europe, the boundary between Siberia and Western Russia. And there, there were people who were not allowed to go with you past this point, so they're saying goodbye. And Kennan describes this as like the saddest place uh, on earth. And this is the same place today, as near as I can tell. I hunted all over for that original marker, which supposedly still existed, but I couldn't find it. And this is the marker that divides those two uh, oblasts, they're called, which are uh, from the western one from the eastern one. So this is the Siberia-Russia uh, boundary, western Russia boundary today. This is Sergei. This is the guide that I went with. Uh, an extremely fit guy. Um, in his mid-60s and, you know, could run two miles on icy roads in Quebec. And, you know, he was uh, extremely active. But you can see sort of maybe in his expression a little ambiguity about what he's up to. And this is Volodya, the other guy that we traveled with. And in the background is Vladivostok. He's on his porch of his apartment in Vladivostok. Me and him. Uh, this is the Kama River. The, the rivers there don't move. They're huge. And they just sit there like big vertical lakes. And it's because Russia slopes northward. And the rivers just... Uh, flow very sluggishly, and, and uh, this is an extremely polluted river. And this is the Yenisei, which is like one of the four great rivers, a view down the Yenisei. I love these, the hugeness of it sometimes. You know, if you're used to the American West and the big sky, and just to see something bigger, uh, really, I really loved it. This is how we Travel, our tents, there's uh, yeah, our yeah. table, <laughs> dish towel hanging wow. up there on the tree. Um, I, I really was convinced I was going to get washed away every night, so I made him put that extra thing on my tent. <laughs> uh, just another river in western Siberia. This is a drawing that I did of a church, um, and... Um, it's the cover of my book. Um, I saw this church from a distance, and I thought, God, that is so beautiful. It's so peaceful. And it's out way in the middle of nowhere. And I went to the church. Finally, I walked over to it. And the inside is so trashed. They just everything, all the frescoes are broken off, and the steps going up are trashed. And uh, those trees that you see, many of them are growing through the church. So it's just a complete ruin. And just the thought that they would go to the trouble of building this beautiful church there and then destroying it. And it's one of the things that I really love about Russia. <laughs> uh, this is on the Barabinsk steppe. This is just another marker between two oblasts, and it's just the nothingness of it. I got really sick one day talking about food poisoning. It wasn't food poisoning, but there was something close. And I was sick for hours. And finally, I staggered out of the woods where I'd been throwing up. And we drove to this town to get more water. And we went to the uh, communal uh, faucet, faucet in the middle of town. And I saw this sign. So I walked out to the sign to see what it said. And it says, Neudachina, <laughs> which means like Unluckyville. <laughs> and Sergey thought this was hilarious, so he, he took a picture of me next to it. That's me and Sergey. The reason that I put this in is that final thing there, Chita, 3,112 kilometers. It's like a road sign here that would say, you know, Phoenix, 2,700 miles. I mean, it was like... <laughs> 
Good to know it's only 3,112 kilometers to Chita. A road in Siberia. This is the road, by the way. I mean, the road would do all kinds of different things. It would become a big road, little road, mud road. This is what it usually was. This is Volodya, and we buy our stuff like we buy dinner along the road, our food along the road. And this is him buying it, and this, my thumb technique, which uh, I got, got down pretty good. This is the van, and you can't really see, but that sign there on the side says, you know, um, I think the MCS stands for Ministerstvo Cherzvichaina Situaciami, which means the Ministry of Emergency Situations. <laughs> and that's Sergei looking out the window in case anybody needs saving. And this is Ivan Yakushkin, who was a Decembrist and a really interesting, cool guy who wrote a memoir of the Decembrist in Russian, and I read it in Russian. It took me like four months, and I, I just love this guy. And you can see, like, they're sort of almost like the founding fathers in America, only uh, maybe a little, a little dicier emotionally. Uh, this is the house of, of Volkonsky in Irkutsk when he was exiled. This is the little house that they built out there. This is the house of Trubetskoy, who was supposed to be the George Washington of the Decembrist movement. And on the morning of the revolution, uh, he suddenly was AWOL and then kind of went over to the emperor and said, gee, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, did not comport himself well, but was a really nice guy during exile and used some of his money to support other exiles who, who didn't have any. Another sketch of mine that didn't come out too good. Just the, the garbage is just phenomenal in Russia. So it was garbage by Lake Baikal. This is the Selenga River. And the Selenga is so incredibly cool. It's huge and wide. And it just flows. It comes out of the steppes of China. Uh, and here, this is from the George Kennan book, uh, an illustration done by Oliver Frost, who was his sketch artist. And this is my drawing of almost at the same spot. And what I'm trying to do is get the just giganticness of it. This is a ferry, and it would take, the, take cars back and forth on that one vehicle ferry. This is a prison. And my first trip, I was constantly trying to find prisons. I went up to the side of this prison. I got out. I said, Sergey, I'm taking this picture. I went out, and he flipped. And he was so mad at me, he drove off. So I'm taking this picture. And you can't see, but on the thing somewhere, if you look closely, you blow it up, it says something like, get the hell out of here. I mean, it's like a very strong stay away sign. I uh, it's, it's took the for, picture. Forbidden zone. Forbidden zone, mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so I took the, the picture, and then I went after Sergey. And he just, uh, it was the biggest fight that we had. Huh. And we didn't speak for uh, like a day and a half afterwards. Um, but that was part of the struggle. But I only did get this one picture. Sketches I did. Again, they're not too clear. If you see here in the, the upper picture, that uh, TV antenna, they have the wildest TV antennas in the world in Russia in every possible shape. In other places, I did drawings of dozens of them. This is a beach near Vladivostok where people go and drink and smash their bottles. And all of that is broken glass. And it's like 50 yards of smooth beach glass. And each wave comes in and picks up this glass. And the picture doesn't show. It's so beautiful. It's like Russia has all different kinds of trash. And occasionally, there will be a little trash thing that is really beautiful. And this beach huh. is its called the Steklanaya Plage, the glass beach. And they brought me just to show it. You know, This is a really pretty beach of broken glass. And this is just new Moscow, as opposed to ordinary Moscow. And this is our driver out in Vladivostok. And this is Sergei and that guy. And this is looking over a Siberian landscape. This is the ice road on Lake Baikal. It goes about 300 miles up Baikal. And uh, we are going up to a, a city or a town at the north end of Lake Baikal. 
This is the ice road, just looking down the ice road. And I went out where the ice was clear, and I lay down on it, and it's, you know, nine feet thick. And you look down, it was just really cool. But the ice was not slippery for some reason, because I guess all the cars driving on it. Um, but, you know, you're just out in the middle of the lake on this road, and it goes from, uh, I think, like uh, December through April or through mid-April. This is a landscape by the Gulag camp. If you read the recent excerpt in The New Yorker, this is uh, on our way on the road, this very scary uh, road with no guardrails that goes to the camp. <coughs> and this is the camp. <coughs> You can see a guard tower. And there's the guard tower. And you see the fence has fallen down. Again, the tower. And there are two lines of fencing. The bridges were all handmade. They had nothing from out of that area. They were made from trees and rocks. And the only non from that area thing were the nails. And this was made by people that cut the logs, toted the rocks. Uh, you can't see their big, uh, like, uh, uh, towers. They're towers that are, uh, rectangles of rocks, uh, rectangles of trees filled with uh, stones. And the skill of this carpentry was just incredible for whatever they did. And in the place where there was, there was just so little there, the ingenuity of the, of the engineering and everything. Uh, in my book I say, you know, is an object built by slaves ever beautiful? And I guess you have to say, yeah. Uh, this is the Ob River uh, near Novosibirsk. In my book, I wanted to do something that uh, would take a notion of Siberia with an actual Siberia. So what I was going to do was go to the Waverly Restaurant downtown, a restaurant owned by Graydon Carter, because I knew it had a section that was called Siberia. And I was going to take a picture of that and have it on one side and have it say Siberia in the Waverly restaurant. And then I was going to have this picture and just say Siberia. Um, but I then found out that the Waverly restaurant does not allow photography. <laughs> so I didn't want to ask, you know. So I, I ended up with just this picture. It was actually easier for me to take this picture of the actual Siberia <laughs> than to take the picture at the Waverly restaurant. And then this is just, this is what a lot of Siberia looks like. So, the stop it. So. <laughs> I think, Sandy, I think we have t uh, time for a couple of questions. Is there a microphone on, on one way? Is anybody? Just to, I, I, somebody needs to, we'll get a microphone over to you. Uh, no doubt, but one sec. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Elaine. I was just in Russia, and the impression I had of it was the lack of architecture. Could you talk, say something about the way Moscow and those other you mean uh, nowadays the lack yes, of architecture? Yes, yes, um, Gee, I mean, it has all kinds of architecture from the past. I guess now they're right. just throwing up any kind of thing. I don't know. Oh, you, okay. I mean, that I didn't, uh, the main kind of architecture I saw in Siberia was of Soviet vintage, and it's, you know, not much to look at. I mean, it's, it's mainly just very... Uh, Bleak. I guess bleak high rises that were not built right. as well as they might have been. So they're all, you know, the, the balconies are falling off and stuff. But I don't know. Are they, I know Moscow's just 
going nuts with building, and I assume that they're just coming up with any new thing they, you know, they're not spending a lot of money on the no. architecture of yeah. it. But. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, sure. if, you, if you could, I'm sorry, I know it's a little inconvenient, but for the historical record. Um, I shared the last Cursing Mommy piece uh, with several uh, uh, friends of mine who, who are women, <laughs> and they laughed outrageously, but they were shocked to find out that it had been written by a man because it felt so accurate. I just wonder if you, if you could c comment on the, on the fame of the Cursing Mommy. Um, well, I've done a bunch of Cursing Mommy pieces. I, I, uh, I really like to do them. Um, the, they're based on my wife. <laughs> Uh, who I do know well, and uh, the original of it was when we lived in Montana. Uh, my daughter had some friends who were Mormon girls. They were very nice girls and very well behaved, and they were in the back of our car. And my wife was driving these girls somewhere, and someone cut in front of her, and she just went shit. And uh, one of the little girls in the back seat said to my daughter, "Cora, your mommy cursed." And so from then I was thinking, yeah, the cursing mommy. Uh, most mommies, I think, do now. So I don't know. I mean, I... I now, Sandy, cursing was like fishing, something that was very hard to get into the magazine in Mr. Sean Sunday. Did I you know. ever give it a shot? Well, I always wanted to do the thing that he didn't want me to do. When I did uh, the Sandy Fraser Dream Team, that was back when you weren't supposed to put yourself in a piece. Right. So I had my own name in a piece like... 500 times. Uh, more than had ever been on a single page. <laughs> and my goal with Cursing Mommy is to put as many curse words on a single page of The New Yorker as has ever appeared. It's really impressive. And it is, sure. it is great to be able to do it. I don't feel like I could just do it any old time. I always wanted to ask you, prior to coming to the New Yorker, this is a fact not known to, to all but true Sandy Fraser aficionados, you worked for another magazine. I did. You worked for, not everybody will remember it, Judith will remember it, We Magazine, We as in Yes, right. um, which was a Hefner or Guccione production? Hefner. Hefner. Copying a Guccione. And what did you do at We Magazine? Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, uh, I wrote captions for pictures of uh, naked people. Can you give us an example? Uh, do you remember the movie Bob and Carol and Ted I and do. Alice? Yeah. Well, I, had, I was given a pictorial that originally had involved <laughs> two male models and two female models. Uh, and they went to Puerto, Puerto Vallarta, and one of them got sick. So there were only one male and two females. And I had to somehow come up with a title and a plot line for this. <laughs> so I wrote, uh, the headline was, Carol and Ted and Alice went to Mexico. Who needs Bob? <laughs> <laughs> and Hefner never read anything in the copy. He only read the headlines. And this is like my first thing I did. And they took it and they showed it and said, wow, Hefner really liked this. And so then they came back and, and wanted me to do other things of that type that had a narrative to it, like the Reeperbahn in Germany. It was just this place where people get dressed up in costumes and do all kinds of sexual things. And it was, that was even more difficult. And it was the, those two were the only, uh, the See, only you, ones. You didn't do those things. fake letters, did you? Imagine. No, my and surprise. there was, there was, my neighbor, yeah. there was somebody there who did do the <laughs> fake letters. <laughs> and we would talk about the fake letters. But no, it was only, I, I, I quit on the day that I had to get my, uh, picture on a, uh, uh, Playboy ID. And it's like a passport, except that they stamp the bunny thing on your head. <laughs> it's like a raised bunny. So, so let me, let me get to William Sean was so impressed with this that he, he hired was. us to the New York. <laughs> he was. 
I knew, you know, if I went to work for commentary or something, I'd go, oh, snore, you know. But I, I said, yeah, I was just working for Playboy out and, because it was, you know, simpler to say Playboy. And Sean, went, hmm, oh, that's, that's interesting. And he asked me the same question. Mm. What were you writing? And I had just finished this Reaper Bond piece. So I said, well, I was doing the leather pieces, you know. And Sean said, okay, fine. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I've traveled a little bit to uh, Ukraine mostly and have also encountered lots of folks from that part of the world. Um, there's been lots of talk about the Slavic soul. Uh, it seems to be a point of pride with a lot of people from Russia and from uh, Ukraine. I'd be curious to uh, hear your stab at defining what that might be. Slavic soul? Hmm. The, the meaning dreamy and philosophical and maybe so. a little lazy and, and maybe a little bit of some other things that might not be mentioned. So you can mention. I, I have no idea. We just, had, we just had leather. <laughs> I mean, I had, <laughs> I've had a few uh, attempts made at defining it to me, but. Uh, uh, I think there's a, uh, let's say, familiarity with suffering, um, a, uh, a stoicism. I mean, I think. If you have Russian friends, and if you ever tell them anything bad that happened, they go, huh, you know, it, it's nothing compared <laughs> to whatever bad thing could have happened. Uh, and, and that, I think... Imagine a combination of Russian Jew. On right, that. right. My mother, my mother calls me up and she says, remember Sadie Rabinowitz? Long pause. Cancer. <laughs> That's where every conversation begins. And it, so when I got to Russia, it was exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Cancer. I, I think it, I, but I, I think it is, it is that uh, uh, there is a romanticism in it that is somehow completely tangled up with. The, it, it, and it's that. hard to get, you know, it, it, one of Joseph Brodsky's themes was that Americans somehow thought, because it was a common translator, that Tolstoy and Dostoevsky were the same writer, essentially. <laughs> and in fact, what he insisted on the notion that he was bored by Tolstoy because of the straight narrative and maybe sanctimony and so on, that Dostoevsky was hilarious. Mm -hmm. That they read those kind of gothic, guilt-ridden psychological dramas as high comedy and so mm -hmm. on. I know my Russian friends have told me about listening to Shostakovich and laughing, you know, and... It's almost like Spike Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We've got time for one last question. Anybody? Sure. I actually went to uh, Belarus a few, a few years ago. It was the strangest place I've ever been. Nothing um, but laughs. Go yeah, right, right. Right. very funny. Uh, it was very, like, Soviet. Um, and... Uh, it's like being in a time warp, and I was wondering if you visited a lot of the other former Soviet republics and how they compared to Russia. I no, I was only in Russia, so I can't. Disappointing. David has been. Yeah, I I I I did very little. Um, I only went to Siberia when there was a disaster, you know, a coal miner strike, a Kemerova, and places. Right. Yeah. But the beautiful, I didn't go to the beautiful bits mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but the other republics, yes, and they're they're radically different, and now they're their own countries and. They're worth going to. There's no stranger place on earth than the various Central Asian republics. Um, you know, anytime you have a country where the leader names the day of the week after both himself and a melon, <laughs> <laughs> then you're in business. Yeah. That's, uh, Anybody else? Yeah. I think we'll do this later. One last. Um, how do you know when to stop, or what is your process for sort of the line between? stopping researching and starting writing? Uh, I could just research endlessly. And I just wait for a sign. Uh, I mean, this time, I would, I'd been working for like 11 years on the book. And my friend Katya, who took me to Russia in my first trip, just said, start writing now. You know, this is hmm. just doing it. This, you've got to start writing right now. And she said, you have to. And she said like in, in February, you have to start writing by September. And I just started writing, and so I started writing in July so she wouldn't bug me. But it was, it was, this, you know, I knew I had done a lot. I hadn't done everything I wanted to, but I just, at that point, I just started to write it. 
Uh, just in closing, I want to tell you that there was no writer on this planet that I wanted to write more for The New Yorker than, than Sandy Fraser. And it gives me incredible um, pride to tell you that this, is, this really is a masterpiece of a, a really great American writer. The um, book is just coming out. Sandy is signing this book this afternoon at 4 o'clock at McNally Jackson on Prince Street. On Prince Street yes. And you can continue the discussion there. I want to thank you, Sandy. Thank you, David.